today um, uh, to this uh, third installment in our series of lectures um, loosely entitled Exploring Family History. Um, but as Ian suggested, the whole point of these talks is to really been to go beyond um, what I would consider to be a very source-based approach to um, family history um, and to finding out about your family in the past. Um, as a professional historian, I guess for me it's all about context. It's all about putting your family member into their broader context so you can really understand what's significant about them um, and what's interesting about them. If we only look at our families in isolation, um, then we'll never really understand how they kind of fit into the historical picture um, and the potential contribution, no matter how humble um, they may have made to the past. Um, so that's really, um, I think, the, uh, the point of my talk today. Um, and obviously, I think we would all agree, and I don't need to say that church records are clearly one of the most significant sources um, for family history. But again, as a historian of religion, um, I never really used um, uh, BMD registers in any extensive way, shape, or form in my own research until I started to do family history uh, more seriously. So it's very much a particular sort of record, um, and one that I will touch on, but not really delve into very much at all. So if you're looking for a how to use um, church registers, this is not the talk for you, I'm sorry. Um, and I think really what I want to do is to kind of broaden out our understanding of um, church records, and particularly the role of the church in the past, and the role that, um, and the way in which our ancestors would have experienced the church, um, say, a hundred years ago. Because I think even though Northern Ireland is the country that it is today, with all of its uh, you know, sectarian history and all the rest of it, I still think that as modern people, we really fail to grasp the way that churches um, operated in, um, in public life and in common everyday uh, life um, in the past. I mean, churches were more than just places where people went on Sunday. For certain churches in particular, they, were, they had official roles that were mandated by the state. Um, that the state, in essence, devolved or subcontracted out to them. And so really, if we want to find our families in the past, the only official or institutional or state records that might mention our family will be, of course, um, church records. And I'm thinking in particular of two examples of the way that this kind of record-keeping responsibility um, has changed. So if we look at parish registers of the Church of England um, or the Church of Ireland in the, um, in the 17th and 18th, 19th century, those were church records, but they were also um, uh, uh, records of the state. They were the only official record, really, of births uh, and marriages. And clearly what happens over the course of the 19th century is, is that that parish registration responsibility gets taken over by the state and in essence becomes um, the civil registration process. Okay, so you have a responsibility being taken away from the church. And the same thing is true for wills and probate, right? Prior to 1858, all wills of a particular type were probated through ecclesiastical courts and through the auspices of this, um, and the structures of the Church of Ireland. Well, of course, after 1858, again, the state steps in and secularizes, if you will, that process, and then now and thereafter, um, the district probate registry offices are responsible, okay? It's not a church responsibility any longer. So we really need to understand churches and the way they operated in the past. This, what I would call institutional religion, or the structures of administration, of churches. And I think we should distinguish that function aside from another aspect of, um, uh, of looking at churches and churchgoers, which is the whole notion of belief, um, what you might term piety, whether or not your family members were religious or not. That's an entirely different subject. Because indeed, if we are to find many of the sources related to family history um, to help us find our ancestors, then we need to be looking in the area of church records. 
Um, but there are also a whole variety of sources, both church and other, that enable us to uncover the religious lives of our family uh, in the past. So what I want to do today then is to look in, as to divide my lecture largely into two parts. So the first part will provide you with a broad overview of religious and uh, denominational structures on the island of Ireland, and talking a bit about the way those structures created records. And then in the second half of the lecture, I want to look at a couple of case studies of different ways that you can use a range of sources to um, perhaps dig a little bit more deeply into the religious experience of your family in the past. Okay? Um, largely speaking. And as I've always said, um, I tend to use my own family background, um, which is um, largely the um, parish of Kilwater in uh, East Antrim. Um, but I've got a couple of other examples that I've thrown in today. Um, I gave this lecture last year and the Peroni's keen for it to be recorded, but I've tried to improve it in the meantime. Okay, so I always think that when you're talking about a system, we need to understand the basics, the basic building blocks. So if we think about the basic building block, which is that Ireland is a Christian country for the most part, up until pretty much the 20th century. And um, that Christianity that manifests itself on the island of Ireland in these main groupings, if you will. So we have the Catholic Church, which everybody was up until the Reformation, when a substantial chunk of people said, you know, we've had it and we're leaving, okay? So they then form Protestantism, roughly speaking, so-called, okay? And then you have um, the Church of Ireland um, and uh, the Presbyterian Church. Now, um, uh, when we look at Protestantism, it always gets very complicated because, of course, Protestants, again, continue to divide and subdivide um, repeatedly, and depending on the country that you're in, it depends on the way a particular denomination is described and or characterized. Um, and I'm going to talk about each one of the denominations in turn in a minute. So I'm just going to skate over much of um, the, the distinctions. But the only thing really I want to say is, is that in Ireland, unusually, although the majority of the population was Catholic, the state church, the church endorsed by um, the British state, was in fact the Church of Ireland, the Anglican Church. Now, there were a number of Protestants who did not adhere to um, the state church, um, and they are known as dissenters in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, and by the 19th century they increasingly become known under the term nonconformists. This is a term which emerges from their decision to not conform to the form of practice of the established church. Okay, so they're Protestants, but they're nonconformists. And in the early modern period, that was almost just as bad as being Catholic, in that they were equally excluded from positions of the state which required you to be Anglican. Um, now, these groups are all, um, all come under a whole different variety of names. So you can see I've listed some of them here. Baptists, Huguenots, Quakers, and Palatines. And then in the 18th century, um, a religious movement called Evangelicalism um, uh, sort of sweeps across the transatlantic world. And a, a one significant denomination emerges out of that movement of religious enthusiasm, and that's Methodism which has a more complex relationship with the established church um, in that um, uh, they sometimes see themselves as members of the church, um, but also sometimes see themselves as a separate denomination. Um, <clears throat> so, um, uh, I also list here this, this, the idea that even though we are talking about Ireland as a Christian country, that really we need to conceptualize religion on the island as not just extending to there, but it kind of keeps going around in the circle, in that you will leave Christianity behind and enter a world of non-Christian faiths, such as Islam, um, uh, Buddhism, etc., and other of the great world religions. Judaism would be another to mention. And then, of course, if you kept going around that circle, 
you would come to a more common position now in the 21st century, that of no religion at all, or atheism. And again, this whole spectrum, um, uh, if we view it in that respect, um, can be seen in Ireland um, at certain key points. But for the most part, um, in the 19th century, which is largely where we're going to focus today, um, there's hardly anybody on the island who defines themselves as non-Christian or um, of no religion. But we'll have a look at that in a second. Trying to work out the rough proportion of denominations on the island of Ireland has always been massively problematic. And it has been a great preoccupation of the, um, of the British state, particularly in the 17th and the 18th century in the wake of the plantation, when many land surveys were being done. And so bishops and other leading members of Irish society would quite frequently engage in, in surveys, trying to work out how many Protestants and Catholics there were in their respective areas. And these sort of are now quite frequently used by family historians as census substitutes. Um, and there's a number of key significant <coughs> surveys of um, population um, uh, that, that survive. But probably for our purposes, the place to start to really get a sense of how many there were um, of each party on the island is 1834, when an investigation into the provision of education um, was launched and has become known that their report as the commissioners, the report of the commissioners for public instruction. And this was really kind of the first time in um, uh, that the divisions of um, Catholics and Protestants had been articulated clearly. And as you can see, the um, Catholic community was clearly the largest um, at roughly 80 percent thereabouts. The Church of Ireland then was the next largest at around 10 percent, and Presbyterians then um, representing themselves as about 8 percent. Now, the accuracy of this survey is debatable, but what isn't is the relative stability of these proportions across the rest of the 19th century. So the size of the, um, the religious communities on the island of Ireland doesn't really change. Now the next, um, uh, the next time that religion is surveyed officially by the state in Ireland is in 1861 with the, um, the annual census of that year. Now again, let me just stop for a moment and talk about um, the census. As you know, the British government from 1821 begins to <coughs> engage in a national census. But religion was something that had never been part of these early censuses until the um, 1851 census was being put together. And at that point, the British government decided that for the census for England and Wales, um, religion would be, would be counted, if you will. But the mechanism that they used for counting um, in 1851 was a very distinctive one. So what they did was, um, they used a reporting method rather than a self-declaration method. So the reporting method involved leaders of the local communities um, reporting on the number of places of worship um, on, in their particular area and estimating the number of people who attended at that place of worship on a particular Sunday morning. Okay, so it was a very distinctive approach to the census. Um, it was highly controversial. It revealed for the English Victorian religious middle classes that the vast majority of the population were not Anglican, as had been expected. In fact, nonconformity, roughly speaking, lies 50-50 in the English census um, with, the, with um, Anglicanism but also the fact that the vast majority of the population didn't actually attend church at all. So what happens in England is this confrontation with what they perceive to be the secularism of the working classes. And this census is hugely controversial at the time. There's lots of challenges to it um, and accusations of false reporting and all the rest. But what really happens is, is that religion is dropped 
as an item on the census. And for England and Wales, religion is not recorded or counted in the census as a category until 2001 again. What's really unusual is, is that although there was no census of religion for Ireland in 1851, there is in 1861. So Ireland, for the first time in 1861, has a full census of religion, but they don't use the reporting method of 1851. Instead, they use self-declaration. People are expected to write how they perceive, what they perceive their religious affiliation to be. So all of our statistics then for 1861 for Ireland are based on people self-declaring, okay? And um, here you can see the, um, the, the, uh, the census of religion. So Ireland, um, unusually then, it wasn't particularly controversial, the 1861 reports, and every 10 years thereafter, religion has been recorded. So Ireland has a fantastic set of statistics, which English um, and Welsh social and religious historians are en deeply envious of when it comes to looking at religious patterns. Now again, you know from dealing with census records that it all really depends on um, the unit by which um, religion is calculated, if you will. So let's look at our, our basic survey results. So these are the results then from 1861. And you can see, like I said, the commissioners of public instruction, their proportions of size and scale are largely, um, largely stable and have really not changed very much at all. You still got roughly 70-75% of the population Catholic and the remaining uh, 30, 25-30% is everybody else. Okay? Now, um, what's, amazing, what's really great is, is that um, now all of the censuses <coughs> of population um, from the 19th century have been made publicly available for free on the internet. So this HistPop website, which is uh, the Online Historical Population Reports website, in essence extracts and makes available online for free um, the printed reports of the annual censuses. Now their, their focus is of course population and demography, um, but um, religion sneaks in there too because the Irish censuses are listed here as well. And so, for example, here you can find, like I did this morning, the Census of Ireland for 1861, and you can see how these statistics are presented. And while it's not telling you who your great granny is, it's certainly going to tell you the, um, the religious character of the town of the parish in which she um, was living. Okay, so you can see here that what they've done is is that they divided it up by barony and then by parish and the town. And so I've just used the top part of this. So you can see here it says a hawkle parish part of. Now for the 1861 census, the um, the enumerators were interested in literacy. So this table also includes the people who can read and write and their literacy figures as well as. So we can know whether or not Anglicans, the proportion, we also know whether or not they could read and write as well. Okay? And so you can see that each column then deals with a different denomination. Established Church, Roman Catholic, Presbyterian Methodist, Independent, Baptist, Society of Friends or Quakers, all other persuasions, Jews, and then the total. Okay, and it does that then for each parish within a particular barony. Okay, so you can actually find that out too then um, uh, about your um, uh, about the locality of your particular family member. Okay. Now you can see just to give you a sense then of how subsequent censuses have dealt with um, uh, these sorts of religious statistics. Here you can see the approach taken in 1911. In this respect, the top level data is far less detailed. Literacy has gone, and instead all you're getting really is the, um, the parish across the top, divided into male and female, um, 
and then the total at the end. You can see as well, they only are prepared to go as far as Methodists, and everybody else after that is chucked into a single category. Okay? So not quite as thorough as 1861. What's also interesting about subsequent statistics is that it can give you a good run of stats. Um, so for example, this is the Census for Northern Ireland of 1926. So in this case, we're only talking about the six counties. But what's very interesting is, is that in their top level tables, they give you the run of stats for, from 1861 right up to 1911. So you don't even need to look at each individual annual census if you don't want to, if you're just trying to get a sense of change over time. And again, what they report is, is that Anglicans and Presbyterians in County Antrim, which is um, where this table is taken from, um, are losing ground, but Methodists are gaining in strength. And this is their, their big stat and their finding, okay? So that's kind of interesting too. You might wonder why your Methodist family member washed up in Antrim, something we'll look at a bit later. And then finally, if you want to see the actual sort of county details, again, by 1926, the units of division are the urban district and the rural district. And again, not the parish any longer. Okay? So you're not really comparing like with like, you have to be careful about that. But you can certainly get a sense of the statistics broken down into a reasonably small locality, which could be useful to contextualize your family's religious background. Okay? So, um, I want to move on now to talk about the geographical spread of the different denominations on the island of Ireland. Because, again, it would all be very handy if everybody was spread out evenly. You, we've got our Catholic majority but, and our Protestant minority, but where do they actually live? As you can see, with the red circles are where Catholics are in a majority. And the uh, circles that are multicolored are areas where there are a variety and a range of Protestant denominations. This clearly, well, if the photograph was a little bit better, it would have clearly shown you the regional um, significance of Protestantism and its concentration in the uh, counties of the north. Here you can see it again, um, where, the, uh, where the red, the deep red, is a um, 60 or more percent Catholic population. And so you can see, once again, that Catholics <coughs> dominate across the island, um, except for um, the, uh, the counties in Ulster and in the north. Okay. So, um, so this kind of gives us a sense of the spread, that it doesn't change very much, that it's quite stable. And let's talk now a bit about um, uh, the sort of the denominations themselves and go back to, um, and if we go back to the 18th century, you may recall that that I said earlier about the, the, the different role that the church played in the state, in that in the 18th century and beforehand too, um, the state was largely what's, what historians call a confessional state. The state had an official church which represented it, which it had said was to be the official church um, that everybody was meant to adhere to and belong to. But of course we all know that Reality didn't work out that way. There were both Protestants and Catholics who refused to become members of the Church of Ireland. But the state used its right to restrict privileges, status, property ownership, and all other sorts of things, access to civil positions, to those who were members of the official state church. And it imposed penalties on those who didn't um, uh, acquiesce. This, of course, led to a whole series of grievances and a range of social and political unrest that I won't go into. But largely, the Church of Ireland, and to a lesser extent, the Church of England, was a target of, um, of, the, of that unrest. And so the government, over the course of the 18th and the 19th century, begins to kind of roll back on this idea of one church to represent the entire people. And a lot of it has to do as well with changing attitudes towards um, loyalty. Um, in, the, in the medieval period, your religion um, determined at times your political loyalty 
to the state. And therefore, whether or not you would be a rebel or commit acts of treason against the state, but by the 19th century, no one is too worried, and religion has become less of a public <coughs> statement and more of an internal expression. And so it's, states are less anxious about having its members be um, different uh, religions than, uh, than itself. And so the state begins to roll back then on the penalties which had, it had imposed on people who did not conform to its view. Of, um, uh, of, uh, of religion and religious expression. But it really means that um, uh, there, were, there were a variety of religious denominations on the island of Ireland, and, uh, but they were organized in very different ways. So I think it makes sense if we look at um, the Church of Ireland first. Now, the, um, the reason I've got this slide here is, is that the Church of Ireland, because it is the official state church, has what I've called a territorial approach to its organization. Yawn, what does that mean? Um, and what it simply means is, is that the church looks at the territory of the entire country and it says, that's us. That is our area of responsibility. And then it divides up that area into effective units of organization so that it can administer and carry out its role. Which we must never forget is, you know, to look after and care for the religious lives of the people who live in the country. So this is a very distinctive approach. And what it means is that um, for, it doesn't matter really who you are or what you say or what you think yourself, if you fall within one of those organizational units, the official state church with a territorial form of organization, sees you as your, their responsibility. Okay? Now, there's a different way of approaching church organization as well, which is this notion of a voluntary church organization. This really looks more at the individual and at the person. So you and your family have a particular set of religious beliefs, your friends down the street feel the same way, and you've got a couple of people on the street over, and all together you want to worship together. Not necessarily the way the state church would have you do, but the way that you feel is appropriate and meaningful. And so together you get together and you form a church. Okay, this is the idea of a voluntary church. A church which is constructed around people in a reasonably a uh, convenient locality, getting together to form a, um, a, a religious group, okay, which shares similar values and attitudes and ideas. Okay, so with those two ideas in mind, let's have a look now at the Church of Ireland. And I love my wee diagrams. And I can see that Kieran has not left me with my laser eye pointer, which is fine. Um, so, roughly speaking, this is kind of the way the Church of Ireland is organized. So if we take a rectangle at the top, and we kind of see that as Ireland, roughly speaking, okay? Then the island of Ireland is divided up by the Anglican Church in the early 18th century into four provinces, okay? Um, each province is then divided up into a number of smaller units called a diocese. Each diocese is subsequently subdivided into even smaller units called a parish, okay? And now technically speaking, parishes are subdivided still further into townlands, but townlands are not Anglican units, okay? They are civil units. So the borders don't always match, though that's why you've got townlands that sometimes straddle parish boundaries, because it's two different systems, okay? You've got your religious system, and you've got your civil system, okay? Um, now, each, I suppose, um, the, the characters who are responsible for these units, you have your archbishop, who's responsible for um, the whole island or the archdiocese, and then you have a bishop who is responsible for a diocese, and then you would have a minister responsible for a parish. Now, the parish ideal in the 19th century was something along this line here. This was the ideal. This is what the Anglican Church said everybody was supposed to have. So every parish was meant to have a church. The church should probably have a graveyard, 
And in order for the, uh, the minister to support himself, there should be what was known as a glebe, a chunk of land which the minister himself had a house on, and surrounding farmland which he could then farm to make money for his income, or which he could let out to local farmers who would farm it in exchange for rent that he would then use for his income. Okay? These financial arrangements are unbelievably complicated. So much so that I still do not grasp them entirely. But the different arrangements are what give Anglican clergymen their respective names. So, depending on your financial arrangement, you could be a rector, you could be a vicar, or if you were unfortunate, you could be a perpetual curate. Because as you can imagine, the understanding of a perpetual curacy is, is that you will always have to be working to serve the rector or the vicar, okay? And that your parish is always a subservient one to, um, to one next door. Now, of course, this ideal doesn't really play in Ireland extensively. <coughs> in some areas, absolutely, this is happening. But in other parts of the country, as you can well imagine, say the west of Ireland, remember our earlier diagram, where there are no Anglicans. Okay, you are not going to have this happy um, ideal. So what the church had to do was it had to group parishes together in what were called benefices. They needed four or five parishes to get enough income together to support a single clergyman. Now some of these could be very large indeed. And in the early 19th century, there were lots of accusations of poor practice because, of course, if you were responsible for three or four parishes and you had several churches to be responsible for as well, there's no way you would be at every single one on a Sunday morning. So this then provokes what was known as absenteeism. The, um, the, the fact that you would employ a perpetual curate, maybe, to take your services, or you just wouldn't even turn up at all. Because indeed, in the early 19th century, many Anglican ministers have been appointed through nepotism or through their connections and were not interested in being clergy. Um, so in this respect, then, um, this gives you a sense of, the, um, of how the Anglican Church was organized and the importance, then, of the parish as a unit of organization. This was meant to be the, the ideal and within this parish, you would then have all of the um, all of the people who lived in that parish would then be the responsibility of, of the minister. And in the bad old days, if you didn't attend church, you could be punished or excluded um, from certain privileges. So the Catholic Church, because it was, you know, the, it was like their first, if we will, um, has a very similar structure. It also operates on a territorial model with provinces, dioceses, parishes. Um, some of the terminology is a little bit different. So you, instead of a minister, you would talk about a priest, and the, the PP, quite often seen in Irish sources, refers to parish priest. Um, but a priest would also quite often have had a curate too, or an assistant to help him. Um, now the problem for the Catholic Church was is that um, as a result of the of um, the Irish Wars of the 17th century, its structure was largely debilitated. And then in the 18th century, the imposition of the penal laws meant that the Catholic Church had a very difficult time functioning effectively as, as a church. And um, uh, over the course of the 18th century, however, it begins its resurgence. There is a repeal of penal laws, a new emerging Catholic middle class, which has spare cash, begins to contribute to um, the, uh, the sort of the re-emergence uh, of the Catholic Church. More trained, more clergy are better trained, and the parish structure, which had been largely debilitated, um, was rebuilt. And, um, sorry, I was trying to find, but I can see where I, what I've done, okay. And so it was largely rehabilitated, and we'll talk about that a bit more um, in, uh, in a minute. Because I wanted to look then at sort of Presbyterian structures. Because Presbyterians and Methodists operate on the voluntary system. So here down here you have all of the people who, are, who call themselves Presbyterian in a particular area. And they then get together to form a church. In their church there's a minister who the congregation themselves choose and elect. 
And the minister governs that church with two committees, if you will. One called the session and one called the committee. Okay, and um, the uh, leading members of the, um, of the church are selected and called elders, and together with some leading laymen, they then run the business of, um, of the congregation as it's known. Congregations are then grouped into a presbytery, a presbytery is then grouped into a synod, and after 1840, synods in Ireland are gathered together in what is called the General Assembly. Okay. Um, and there you have it. Methodist structures are kind of this, are similar, um, but a little bit more, or, but have their own terminology. So once again, you have a gathered church or a voluntary church, um, which is in the 18th and the early 19th century called a society, um, and is governed by either a traveling preacher who's a full-time worker, um, but he's assisted by local preachers who are laymen within the congregation who support um, the traveling minister because the traveling minister was responsible for a circuit, this next unit here, churches within a particular locality that he would travel to on successive Sundays. So on the times when he wasn't available to preach, the local preachers would then step in. So, um, uh, so circuits were then grouped into districts and the Methodists' annual um, uh, meeting was known as the annual conference and was held once a year. Now what we haven't really talked about, I suppose, is, is, the, um, these, is the all other persuasions. Because I think it's actually really interesting. Um, because really, the, um, uh, the, in 1861, the number of people who said that they were not one of the big four amounted to 18,798 people. Quite a significant amount, and that actually excludes Jews, who are an additional 322 on top of that, or 393 if you want to include merchant seamen. Okay. Um, and so what the census enumerators do is they print this table of everybody else. On the, on the island. And you can see that in 1861, it's, you know, it's slim pickings, really, that um, except for these top ones, which are largely splinter groups of Presbyterians, the Moravians, and a growing uh, group of uh, Christian brethren or brethren, really there's hardly any other minorities of any significant size. 67 Mormons, there's one Hindu woman in Ireland in 1861, and what's interesting as well is, is that only 90 people in Ireland in 1861 declare that they are of no religion, but 971 write unknown, <laughs> which I'm still trying to puzzle out what that actually really means. Um, now what ha so, um, so what do we do then? Um, or how does the, um, the structures of the church change over the course of the 19th century? and what drives many of the changes um, that take place. Well, one of them is the British state, in that the British state is becoming so much more tolerant um, uh, of a wider range of religious views, and it's prepared to accept and to allow into the state people with different religious views. So in 1828, nonconformists have many of the, um, of the discrimination is repealed. In 1829, Catholic emancipation takes place. In the 1860s, Jews are allowed into Parliament, and all these sorts of things are sign of a growing secular state and of a growing tolerance within the state that the state does not want to get involved in religious disputes or discussions. But also what's happening too is theological developments and changes taking place within the denominations themselves. So I spoke about evangelicalism, this movement of religious enthusiasm that fires all the Protestants up in Ireland. Anglicans as well as Presbyterians, it generates this new group called Methodists, and they all start running around the country trying to save everyone and promote a conversion experience. They're highly active, and they quite often have the, at times I would suggest, unintended effect of antagonizing um, uh, Catholics within the community who felt that they were deliberately trying to convert them uh, to, their, to, their, um, to their way of thinking. And the problem was, too, of course, was that Catholics had their own vision of, um, 
uh, and of, uh, of a renewal movement, which was called Ultramontanism, which was this movement um, away from uh, uh, a particular view of the Catholic Church to one which was much more centralized and based around um, uh, the Pope in Rome. Um, the, these social and economic changes which I write, write about here, the growing size of the Irish population, the impact of the famine, and most importantly, modernization, um, all have a real impact on uh, the churches. And um, uh, so these changes can be roughly summarized in that the Church of Ireland um, struggles in the 19th century to remain the state church. By 1870, the government disestablishes it, and it is no longer the state church anymore. This is despite the fact that it had largely reformed the way it had operated. Presbyterians, who had been very divided over a whole range of theological issues, begin to come together, and by 1840, the large majority of them unite in the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. And there are just small splinter groups then that remain. And again, for the Catholic Church, it begins to experience its great expansion into, um, uh, uh, into its dominance, I suppose, of, um, of 19th century life. And what's quite interesting, actually, is, is that when you look at the state of the Catholic Church in 1704, you can see where the strength of the church there lay. The proportion of continentally trained priests in 1704 shows that clearly Catholic strength lies in the south and in the east. If you look at the value of Catholic parishes in 1800, again, those valued at more than 200 pounds, concentration in the southeast. If you look then at 50 pounds or less value, mostly in the west and in the north. So you can see where the church is strongest in Ireland. And you can also then, um, and then, and so what historians have done is to try and measure um, the, uh, and look at the emergence of the Catholic Church by looking at the first incidents of Catholic records with the idea that this is a sign of stability, of confidence, and um, uh, of, um, uh, of growing stability. And so Kevin Whelan, who's done all of this research, plotted out the date of the first surviving Catholic register for um, dioceses across Ireland. And you can see that starting in the 1740s, there are fewer than 10 um, parish registers being started. But the real bulge is in the 1820s and the 30s. So this tells us that around about the 1820s and the 1830s, the Catholic Church as an institution is beginning to um, grow substantially. But it's regionally varied, as has already been suggested. In the 1750s, you can see the dots um, show very few, central. Okay? But this period here is significant. South and the East, again, emerging first, okay? And it was not until the post-1870 period, really, that the Catholic Church begins to grow and um, expand itself. Similarly to here, this is just comparing dioceses. If you look at the dioceses in the, um, uh, in the North, you can see that their first parish registers are much later, 30s, 40s, then say, in Ossory, or could there in Lachlan even, where it's slightly earlier. So, um, I'm not going to talk about that a little bit. I'm going to very quickly then skip over to, um, uh, to my examples or my case studies. I'm not sure I've really kind of... So if we're looking at the churches then over the course of the uh, 19th century, what you have happening is, is that the church is becoming more vibrant, better organized, um, the Anglican church losing its official status, becoming on the same plain, playing field, as you will, as the other denominations. The Catholic church grows in confidence and soon comes to um, uh, command uh, respect within a wide range of um, political forums. And so the landscape is very, very different than what it was um, uh, 100, 150 years beforehand. 
But let's have a look now at what we can do with our own families, right? Because it's all, I'm sure, getting a bit tedious. So I thought I would ask you about three or four questions um, that you could potentially explore um, using my own family, or questions that I've tried to ask and tried to solve using a variety of church and church-related records. And you know there's, there is um, my relative, Ellen Shilliday Martin, the battle axe in the center here. Um, and um, I'm curious about how I might find out when she was born. Uh, her, she appears in the 1901 and in the 1911 census, and both of those give a rough estimate of her birth date at around 1831. So before civil registration, which is disappointing, um, but is there a church um, register? Is, that would be the obvious next step to go and look for her. So of course, we hop over to Prony, where, if you haven't found it already, the fantastic online guide to church records sits there, available. Um, this is a finding aid, okay? There's no records inside, but if you scroll, if you scroll down to, um, you can find your location. So I know that Ellen Shilliday was born in Maharali Townland, in, oh, sorry, in Maharali Parish, um, outside Dromore in County Down. And here's what Prony has in their collection. Um, and you can see how they've organized the material, with the Church of Ireland material at the top, then the P standing for Presbyterian, and RC standing for, obviously, for Catholic. And you can see that it looks to me like they've got baptisms, 1837, possibly a bit late, but quite a range of other material. So, I got the microfilm out, and I had a great big look. I didn't find her. Um, so I still don't know when she was born. But what I was able to discover was a range of other kind of interesting material. Because in the other bits, in the account book, and in what this is called a stipend list, I was able to find lots of shillings floating around. I can't prove that any of them are her family members or her father, or even a grandfather, but it's certainly <coughs> true that there are Shilladays who live in this area, and if I was to work a little harder, I might be eventually able to connect some of these men to other men to whom Ellen might have been related. And what's quite interesting is this thing called a stipend list, because that's the, um, the list of people who are church members who are obliged to pay a fee, um, essentially to maintain the minister for his salary. Okay? but almost everybody on the list is in arrears by at least six months, if not more. So my Shilladay relatives are no worse um, as church members than anybody else, it doesn't seem to me. Okay, so the next question then I thought I would, so that was just kind of your basic box standard, straightforward church record search, and hopefully you might be a bit luckier than I was. But something else as well is I wonder if we come across when we're looking at our families is like what denomination was our family? And this idea that we find a record and it shows what their denomination is and we go, Eureka, aha, they were Presbyterians. Because indeed, here we have um, uh, Ellen Shilladay's son, Samuel Martin, his wife Susan Ogilvie, um, and their two daughters and her brother, Alexander Ogilvie. And in the census of 1901, it records their denomination as Presbyterian. But were they Presbyterian? I know Susan and Samuel were married in the non-subscribing Presbyterian church in Valley Clare, which is a little way down the road from uh, Kilwater, where they were living. And it took us ages to find them because, of course, there is a non-subscribing Presbyterian church in Kilwater, just kind of down the road, where there was no marriage for them at all. So what I thought I would do is, is that to try and get a sense of what denomination are the Oglebees, is, is that I searched for all Oglebees in Kilwater in 1901, okay, and I found 12. And I listed the first 10 because the other two are on the next page, but you get the idea, okay? And you can see here, how do they self-describe themselves, right? You can see that someone describes themselves as a Unitarian, okay? Some describe themselves as non-subscribing Presbyterians, and some simply just as Presbyterian. Now, as a historian, I'm thinking, you know, that's kind of interesting. 
to what extent can we be sure then when someone says they're Presbyterian that they're not just being lazy or that they see themselves as Presbyterian without the prefix non-subscribing, right? To my mind, Susan and Samuel are non-subscribing Presbyterians. Susan's family background is non-subscribing. And so that kind of raises interesting questions. If you find a family member who's a member of a religious minority or kind of an obscure religious group, ooh, to what extent is that significant or distinctive? I mean, non-subscribing Presbyterians are often described as Unitarians in Irish records, even though they themselves don't always like that description. Um, and the theological position of the members can vary really quite a lot. Unitarians would suggest that they're a little soft on the deity of Christ um, and don't quite accept Jesus as um, a full member of the Trinity. Um, Non-subscribers broke away from the Central Presbyterian Church in the 1840s over this whole issue of subscription, which is, to, which is the requirement that all Presbyterian ministers swear an oath to uphold the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is the standard theological statement for the Presbyterian Church. But a lot of it is to do not so much with trying to go soft on the theology, is the idea that they don't like swearing oaths. They don't think that you can really uphold them, so they don't feel comfortable being asked to swear something that they couldn't possibly maintain. When my son was asked whether or not he would be loyal to the Boys' Brigade, he said, I'll try, right? And I think that that's how non-subscribers feel about subscription as well. And what's quite distinctive as well is, is that about the area around Kilwater then, is, is that everybody knows that country people go to the non-subscribing church because it is described as top of the town. It's the closest church for country people if you are coming into Lauren Town. So to what extent then were my relatives, the Ogilvy's, non-subscribers because they had a theological commitment or because it was the handiest church to them, which all of their neighbors had, had gone to? And what is becomes clear, there you can see the church there. Um, and there you can get a sense of that if you're trying to find non-subscriber ancestors, you can you can plot where the congregations are, and you can plot then um, uh, uh, where the records are. And um, what I should have said then was, I'm going to just skip over this, was that um, when the Ogilvies and the Martins move to Canada, they become Methodists, and then they eventually wash up in the Brethren, which is where I grew up. Um, so this idea that religion is a fixed thing that a person has for their whole life is not necessarily true. Life circumstances can change all of that. Now, I'm going to do one more example, is that okay? Okay. Um, uh, and, um, but whether or not it was unusual for the Ogilvies to be non-subscribers, in this part of the world, absolutely not. If you look at and do a little local survey, um, which I kind of do back here, right? This is Kilwater in 1901 and 1911. And you can determine and, and use the statistics to give yourself a sense of the typicality of your family's background. So to be non-subscribing in Kilwater at this time is nothing unusual. It's very distinctive. Okay. And so this is kind of the last one, um, or the, um, the last example that I'm going to look at, which is um, uh, this is um, the Reverend Hugh Hanna, a Presbyterian minister from Belfast, quite controversial. Um, uh, but I'm interested in his daughter, Frances Helena, who never married um, and was um, the, uh, who was the, uh, he, she inherited her father's estate um, and she had a reputation in the few sources that talk about her um, as being a, a, a helper to her father. He describes her like that in his will. So I was curious about whether or not I could find anything out about her religious life. Because if you read the biographies of a big Presbyterian minister like this, they never talk about family, particularly female family. So what I did was that, and again, this is more difficult for, uh, for you if you don't have access to a university library. Although I think libraries and archives are starting to subscribe to online digital versions of newspapers. So if you have access to an online digital version of a newspaper, you can do a keyword search. So I plugged in Miss Hannah into the 
Belfast newsletter between, and then restricted it by the dates of 1885 and 1900. And I found that there were four or five different Miss Hannahs who floated around. One was a singer, one was um, a, clearly a member of the elite, she had lots of money, she got invited to balls, um, uh, and one was the secretary of the Irish Women's Temperance Union. Were any of these Miss Hannahs my Miss Hannah? Could I plug in her first name? No, because nobody ever used first names in 19th century newspapers. It was always Miss Hannah and her mother, Mrs. Hannah. So, you know, thanks for helping us to narrow it down. Um, so, what would I do? Well, I knew that Helena had been involved with public charitable work with her father. Um, she'd been involved in the St. Enoch Sunday Schools. Church records about the Sunday Schools show that she ran her own class. Um, but I was able to find one single newspaper reference that clearly links her to the secretary of the IWTU. So here's a newspaper article talking about a public meeting of the uh, Temperance Union when, in which um, a, uh, an address was delivered by Mrs. Byers of Victoria College, Belfast, and Miss Hannah, daughter of the late and esteemed Reverend Dr. Hannah Belfast. Bingo. Okay. So in that sense, newspapers can equally show you not just your family relations, but they can also connect you to the wider, um, the wider religious lives of your, of your family. And what's very interesting is, is that after, Hannah, after Helena's father died in 1892, she traveled all around the country for the IWTU. And I kind of think, yeah, good on her, you know, she spent her life supporting her father and his congregation. But after he died, she got to travel, she got to run an organization, she was involved with some of Belfast's leading females, um, like Mrs. To Ms. Todd and Mrs. Byers, educational activists, suffragettes, and all the rest. And I think that's kind of interesting to be able to then speculate about her life and the importance that religion would have played in it. And I think we'll leave it there. But for one final thing I wanted to mention, which was um, some research principles then as we go forward to do our own research. Don't forget that denominational affiliation isn't fixed in time. Just because your family are the most rabid Presbyterians ever doesn't mean that one of them might not have married a Catholic. That happened to you, Hannah. You know, um, which I shall tell some story, that story another time. Um, don't forget, too, that sources can be really inaccurate in understanding religious specifics, right? So it's clear that people on the census didn't know how to describe their affiliation to non-subscribing Presbyterianism. And therefore, some people describe themselves simply as Presbyterians, which is not, technically speaking, what they were. And I particularly warn against street directories where clearly these people were secularists of the worst sort and had no notion of the way churches organize themselves and therefore are full of inaccuracies about um, churches and ministers and all of that sort of thing. And remember too that trying to understand the normality or not of your family depends to a certain extent on you being able to put them into this broader context. Were they the only Catholics in the village? Or were they one of thousands um, of uh, of people? Were they part of a religious minority? Um, or did they uh, break away? Um, did they remain true to their religious faith? Or did they stop going to church? All these sorts of questions. It all really depends on how important or significant or interesting those questions are. Depends on the environment in which your family operated. So I do encourage you to get out from just looking at your family and to looking at the, the world around them and hope that you'll then enhance your understanding of their contribution to history. Okay, thanks very much.